Hi everybody and welcome back. I wanted to do a lecture today that talked a little bit about some of the basics associated with um, some of the fundamental aspects of seismology and, and the theories that, that drive the very occurrence of earthquakes. Why they occur, um, how they occur, and then talk a little bit about some of the different types of seismic sources or, or faults that generate earthquakes. Um, and then a little bit about how seismologists today and, and even some engineers like me can use uh, some prediction models to try to predict the, um, the size or the uh, geometry of an earthquake. So today we're going to cover things like um, elastic rebound theory different um, fault types, whether they're crustal or subduction zone, and then, of course, earthquake size. So let's begin. Um, elastic rebound theory. This is one of the most basic theories associated with seismology and earthquakes, and it's, it's really quite simple. Imagine if you were holding like a brittle stick. Uh, just right out in front of you, not with one hand, but with two. You are holding both ends of the stick. Now imagine as you are holding both ends of the stick, you move your left arm up slowly and your left arm down slowly. And you, you keep your, um, you're, you're, you're holding the ends of the stick. You're keeping that stick rigid as you're just translating one arm up, one arm down. So it looks kind of like um, this right here, where you start to bend and bend and deform the stick, but eventually what's going to happen is you're going to fracture that stick. If that stick is brittle, it will fracture. Um, if it was like a, a young stick or wasn't old or brittle, then it would probably bend and flex. But uh, we're, we're doing this mental experiment with a stick to represent uh, another material that's very brittle, and that is rock. Rock is very, very brittle. At least rock that is in the lithosphere is very brittle. And so when it begins to strain, and strain it can, it, it can deform. It can deform quite a bit, actually. But eventually, you strain it enough, and it will fracture. And um, once it fractures, it releases all of this energy. And all of that energy then um, uh, is, is sent out in the form of seismic waves. So it's that sudden fracture of the rock that causes the release of that energy uh, that we know as seismic waves in the form of, of body waves typically, okay? So again, this is elastic rebound theory presented in 1911 by Reed. So it's been around for a little while. So part of this theory too is the details that goes into it. And, and um, we know that, that when movement occurs on a fault, it's, it's all due to stress being locked up in different places on the fault. And, and usually there's, there's a places where the stress is just concentrated and it's causing the fault to lock up. Now, um, as stress gets transferred around um, to what we call asperities, asperities are points of stress buildup. So think of these as like little um, jagged spurs or, or places where the plates or the crust just lock up. Um, so as stress gets transferred between these, these places of stress concentration or the asperities and, and um, it begins to lock up again and it will lock up, lock up until the strain gets so large that all of those asperities break just boom, 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 boom and then you get this big rupture uh, and um, then you get strain a big release of energy along the fault, and then all that energy is released, and new asperities form, and it eventually locks up again. Um, after an event, interestingly, as uh, stuff, all the stresses are trying to work themselves out, 
and everything's trying to find a, a new balance and a new equilibrium. Those redistribution of stresses across the asperities lead to what we, we refer to as aftershocks. Some people have asked me in the past, why do aftershocks occur? We have this big earthquake and then it feels like the ground never stops shaking for days, sometimes weeks. Well, that's because the ground is trying to find a new equilibrium and uh, the new asperities haven't locked up yet. And so uh, that's the main reason. So uh, uh, another misconception that a lot of people have is that if an earthquake happens and they know that they live next to a fault and, and this could be a really big fault, lots of times people think, oh, you know, if that whole fault goes, then I'm going to be in big trouble. But the reality is that entire faults rarely rupture all at once. Usually instead they rupture just in parts of the fault. So usually in small sections that we call segments. So a fault will be divided up into um, what we call segments. So if I have, for instance, this big long fault that looks like this, but uh, paleo seismologists may dig and may find that this section of the fault uh, tends to rupture on a, a certain frequency, but this section of the fault ruptures on another frequency, and this section of the fault ruptures on another frequency. So we might have then one, two, three segments of a fault. And each segment can behave independently of the other segments or, or not. I mean, there's lots of evidence that sometimes um, more than one segment can go, or the rupture of one segment could lead to the rupture of another segment. So uh, there's, there's no hard or fast rules on these, but just understand that faults are usually divided into segments. So if a long time passes before a, a certain fault uh, segment ruptures, then you know that asperities are locked up and stress is building up on that fault segment. And eventually, eventually, that fault segment is going to rupture. And this is what we call a seismic gap. So a seismic gap is a place, a fault segment along a known fault where we haven't had seismic activity for a long time. So um, this is a figure out of uh, the Kramer Geotechnical Earthquake Engineering textbook. I love this figure because it really shows what's going on. Uh, what we have here is a graphical representation of the San Andreas Fault through about half of California. So we have here distance, okay? So you can see uh, it starts up near San Francisco, up near the, uh, the northern edges of the fault where it flies out into the Pacific Ocean. Um, and then it ends down here past, a little past parks filled, okay? So as we're headed down towards Southern California. So, um, what this fault represents, every single one of these dots that you see on this figure here represents a recorded seismic event, a recorded earthquake. And uh, its location on there, uh, in the, each of these boxes, represents the depth below the ground surface that that earthquake was traced back to using uh, what we talked about in lecture number three, triangulation. Okay, so what we have here on, on part A up here on this first part is all of the recordings that uh, occurred 20 years prior to the 1989 Loma Prieta event. So you see we had an event on uh, this segment of the San Andreas, how do I know? Well, look at all those dots. So we know that there was an earthquake um, on that segment during the, that 20 year period. And it looks like on this segment too, there was an earthquake because we see lots of dots. But check out these other segments. Just a couple dots on uh, this segment here, a couple dots on this segment here, and a couple dots on this segment down here. Well, check this out. In October of 1989, the Loma Prieta earthquake happened uh, just south of uh, San Francisco near uh, San Jose area, uh, near Loma Prieta, actually. And this plot down here 
represents the main shock, which is this big circle right there, and then all the other aftershocks that were recorded from the Loma Prieta earthquake. So if I take all these dots and I transfer them back up with their cousins up here in this first plot, you can see that we would fill in a whole bunch of dots in this seismic gap. That's right. That's why we call it a seismic gap because it means that there was a gap of data before the earthquake happened. So once this data moves up here, we still have a gap in the San Francisco segment. And, and interestingly, we had a gap in Parkfield, but um, <clears throat> I thought this was pretty cool. In 2004, the Parkfield event happened. So this segment also got filled up with its dots all of its seismic activity that happened. That leaves one more seismic gap remaining. That's right, the feared San Francisco event on the San Andreas. That fault is locked and loaded and it's ready to go. Now, um, this may seem like a random thing to talk about, but I, I do want to mention it just briefly and we'll talk more about it later this semester. But when a fault ruptures, it doesn't just rupture all at once. Like the fault was still and then the next millisecond, it's all ruptured and it's done. What happens is a section of the fault, a section of the fault, uh, let me go back here. So let's say here's our fault again and let's say this segment right there is going to rupture. So what happens is rupture begins where one of the major asperities breaks. So let's say it's right there. Then as stress rapidly distributes to the other asperities on the segment, they start breaking too. So you could have um, propagation of the rupture um, in both directions or in one direction uh, from where the initial asperity broke. So as uh, it's almost like ripping a zipper open and, and so you get this ripping effect up the segment, down the segment from where uh, the rupture initially occurred, okay? So as every time a rupture or every, every time a rupture occurs on a fault, every time an asperity breaks, it releases a giant amount of energy in the form of body waves that begin to uh, transmit and, and, and move through uh, the surrounding rock. And that's what this figure down here represents, okay? So let's say here at time equals zeros we have our, our, our initial rupture and this ring around that initial rupture is the, the ring of energy as it starts to um, emanate from the original source. And then due to stress distributions another asperity breaks in this direction. So here, uh, right here where I'm coloring, that was the initial rupture and the asperity next to it now broke. So energy is um, emanating from that rupture as well, but we still have the energy that's still emanating from the first asperity rupture. Uh, the second leads to a third asperity rupture. The third leads to a fourth asperity rupture, the fourth to the fifth, and so on and so on. And every time there's a new rupture, as this rupture starts ripping up the, the segment of the fault, more energy is released. Now notice what happens. Each of these rings just represents the spreading out of the energy, the spreading of those body waves in, in three dimensions. Notice how in the direction, in the direction of the fault rupture, we get a stacking, a stacking of energy. All those waves start piling up in the direction of the rupture, okay? And, and you can tell that because all those circles representing again the, the spreading energy, look how they just start piling up. That is a huge conglomeration or, or constructive interference of waves that, that produces a huge amount of energy, okay? So this zipper ripping effect of faults um, is going to produce greater ground motions in what we call the fault normal direction, 
meaning that if uh, my fault is aligned in, well, let's go back to my figure. I think it's easier to see on that. Okay, if I go back to my whiteboard and my fault ruptures in this direction, okay, what we're going to see is that the waves that are emanating out from my fault, like this, as the waves come out of the fault, if I take the axis that is parallel, I'm sorry, perpendicular, perpendicular to my fault orientation, we call that the fault normal direction. Uh, the direction, by the way, that's parallel to the fault rupture is what we call, yeah, you guessed it, fault parallel direction, okay? Uh, there is some data, quite a bit of it, that suggests that ground motions are larger in the fault normal direction. So meaning that uh, if I were to line up a, a building or something so that it's weak axis aligned with the fault normal direction of the fault, it might put be in danger, it might be put in danger. Um, fault, the data also suggests that Ground motions tend to be a little bit smaller in the fault parallel direction. This fault normal versus fault parallel direction is what we call directionality, okay? Directionality of ground motions. Uh, so, but we talked about this stacking of energy, okay? Going back to this, this constructive interference of the waves in the direction of the fault rupture is what we call forward directivity. Directivity. So what we talked about with the fault normal, fault parallel, that's directionality. So there's directionality and there's directivity. Directivity has to do just with the stacking of the waves. It has to do with constructive interference. Now, interestingly, notice what's going on, by the way, um, in the opposite direction, uh, the direction away from fault rupture. Notice how there's a spreading out of the waves, okay? So we can get um, deconstructive interference in, in those instances. Um, but the spreading out of the waves also prolongs the ground shaking. So the ground shaking may not be as intense in the um, in the backwards directivity direction but in the forward directivity direction ground motions can be very intense and very powerful and in general if you're within about 10 kilometers of a rupturing fault um, you can feel the effects of this forward directivity particularly to high period structures or structures that have a high period of vibration or a low frequency of vibration. So these would be structures like bridges, water tanks, tall buildings, that kind of thing. So directionality, directivity, those two things are what we refer to as near source effects. Near source effects. We'll talk more about that in a future uh, lesson, okay? So, one thing I like to remember about directivity, it's, easy, it's a way to help me remember it. It's, directivity is just like the Doppler effect. This is something you can look up on YouTube or on the internet. You'll see it with like police sirens. So if the police car is driving towards you, the pitch of the sirens uh, on the police car will always sound higher pitched and then when the car drives past you, it sounds like the pitch is changing. It's like, it, it's almost like the siren changed, but it didn't. All that changed was the, um, the velocity of the sound waves relative to you. When the car was approaching you, the velocity of the waves were faster. The waves were stacked together. When the car passes you, the waves are stretched out, so it changes the pitch of the waves, okay? So elastic rebound theory is important. 
And it's important because we can attempt to quantify then with this theory the amount of work. The amount of work that's performed when an earthquake occurs. Well, why in the world would we ever want to compute that? Well, because work is uh, another way we, we can describe energy. And so if we can quantify how much work an earthquake or went into an earthquake, then we can quantify the amount of energy it released. So to do this, we're going to compute a term called the seismic moment. And here's the equation for the seismic moment. That m sub naught is the seismic moment. This little mu right there, that represents the rupture strength of the rock on the fault. So this, think of this as like the, the peak compressive strength of the rock, okay? Or the, I guess it would be the, the peak shear strength of the rock. Then we have area. This is the rupture area along the fall. So what would this look like? It would look something like this. Okay, I'm going to do my best to draw a three-dimensional picture here. Don't judge me. I am not an artist. Okay, so let's say I have a cross-section of a fault. It's going to look something like this. Right here is the fault. Okay. Actually, let's let's just bring this all the way down. Do, 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 do. There we go. Okay, so here's the fault. The fault extends down, extends down, like that. Okay, so you can imagine that we have this block, this big block right here. And we have an upper block up here. And this big block on the right, this one can move down. And this one stays, the one on the left will stay. So if that's the case, okay, if we want to compute the surface area uh, for the rupture, all it is is the area of the fault where the two planes slid against each other. So in this particular instance, it's going to be this surface area right here. So that A is going to equal the uh, surface area of the fault rupture. So you have to start thinking of faults in three dimensions. You have to start picturing the fault plane as it goes down into the Earth's surface. And um, when movement occurs, there's going to be friction between both sides of the rock and the soil on that plane. And wherever there's friction occurring, that's the surface area of the fault. Okay, so that's our A right there. The D, or this D bar, is going to be the average displacement that occurred along that uh, rupture area. So how much slip occurred on the rupture. Okay, now seismic moment. Uh, there's different ways to describe energy. Uh, for instance, we could put it in terms of joules, or we could put it in ter terms of ergs. Uh, one joule, of course, is one newton meter of work. Generally, we, uh, when we're talking about seismic uh, moment, we use units of ergs, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 7 joules. Okay, now you understand seismic moment, and if you knew the geometry of a fault and you knew how much it slipped, you could compute the seismic moment. Oh, and if you also knew the shear strength of the rock, you could compute it. Now,
what we're going to do with this little figure here is we're going to learn a little bit about how we describe the geometry of faults and the geometry of earthquakes. Okay, so let's say that we have the ground surface here represented by this, this oval and we have uh, a student, a happy student walking along the ground on the ground surface. Now, let's say somewhere down beneath the ground surface at some depth, a uh, rupture occurs on a fault and an earthquake occurs. So, if we, uh, that location where the rupture initiated, the initial asperity broke in the fault, we call that the focus or sometimes we call it the hypocenter of the earthquake. It's the, it's the very location in three-dimensional space beneath the ground surface where the earthquake began. Now, if we just draw a line straight up from the focus to the ground surface, that length of that line is what we call the focal depth. And then that location on the ground surface directly above the, the focus or the hypocenter, that's what we call the epicenter. Some people confuse the epicenter with the focus, thinking that the epicenter is down in the ground. It's not. It's just the projection of the focus onto the ground surface. Now, from the epicenter, if we just draw the shortest linear distance from the epicenter to our uh, happy student, who's probably now unhappy because of the earthquake, that shortest linear distance is what we call the epicentral distance. And then if we take the shortest linear distance from the focus to our student, that's what we call the hypocentral distance, or sometimes we call it the focal distance. So, looking at fault notation, Let's imagine now we have this fault. So we have, um, again, this fault plane, which represents the fault diving down into the earth. Think of this again as our uh, three-dimensional drawing that we had before, okay? Yeah, something like that. Okay. Anyway, a couple of things. First, the angle that that fall plane dives, that angle from the horizontal. So it's just, it's the angle from the horizontal that that fault dips down and goes down into the earth. That's what we call the dip, okay? Now, the strike uh, is the orientation of uh, the intersection of the two blocks of earth. So in other words, you can see on, in this instance, uh, this first block intersects the second block and if we just draw the, a line along that intersection the orientation of that line um, usually in terms of an azimuth that's what we call a strike so if I go back to my little drawing here and I'll use black that intersection of that block on the right that's going down and the block on the left that's staying that right there is the strike. And it's going to have some geographic orientation. It could be pointing to the north, it could be pointing to the northeast, to the east, or whatever. It could be cr slightly curved. You know, rarely are they totally linear. But uh, that, that intersection is what we tend to see as a fault on the ground surface. And its orientation, its azimuthal orientation, is what we call the strike. It's the strike of the fall. Okay? All right. So if the dip is the downward dive of the fault, then the actual angle of the dip is what we call the dip angle. So if I have a fault that I call a strike slip fault, 
that means that the fault is going to move in the direction of the strike. So if I go back to my little figure here, a strike slip fault means that instead of moving down, my block is going to move parallel to the direction of my strike. So I'm going to have translation instead of um, uh, up and down motion, okay? So that would be what we call a strike slip fault. Now if I get uh, up and down sliding on my fault plane, meaning that the block is now sliding in the direction of the dip, then I have what's called a dip slip fault. Okay, so this happens when I have compression going on between the rocks and this thing slides up relative to the block on the left. Or if I have extension going on and as uh, it's extending, this block on the right slides down the dip face um, relative to the block on the left. So, but either way, if it slides up or down, we call it a dip slip. So you have strike slip, meaning translation, movement in the direction of the strike, or dip slip, meaning up and down movement on the fault plane in the direction of the dip plane. So let's learn a little bit about the different types of crustal faults, okay? So one of the most common types of crustal faults is a strike slip fault. Uh, we Just like what we just talked about. So this is a fault where you have horizontal translation uh, in the direction of the, the fault strike. So um, you tend to see this with transform regimes. There's two types of faults. Um, you have a right lateral strike slip and a left lateral strike slip. The way to remember this is imagine um, one person standing on one side of the fault and another person standing right across on the other side of the fault. Okay? Imagine those two persons are friends and they reach across the fault and they shake each other's right hand. Right hand. If an earthquake occurs while they're shaking each other's right hand and the person whose hand they are shaking moves to their right, in other words they shift to their right, that means it's a right lateral strike slip fault. If the person whose right hand they're shaking across the fault moves to their left then you have a left lateral strike slip fault. So uh, this particular fault that we're showing right here, where you see these arrows that are indicated, uh, would this be a right lateral or a left lateral strike slip fault? Oops, that's right, it, it would be a left lateral. So in other words, that if these people were shaking hands across the fault, the person across the fault would be moving to that to uh, their left. So that means it's a left lateral fault. Now, typically, these dip angles, okay, are around 90 degrees. So you have like a, a vertical fault, basically. And um, we usually see these types of faults associated with strike slip faults, okay? Now, some of you might be wondering what in the world am I doing showing a beach ball on this figure? What does that have to do with anything, okay? Um, we, I'm trying to remember the right name for these. Um, I believe they're called uh, stereo net projections. That's the correct term for them, but uh, I never call them that, and people I associate with never call them that. We just call them beach balls, okay? And what they are, are they're two-dimensional representations of the, the movement along a fault. So to understand stereo net projections, imagine an eyeball, 
Imagine an eyeball. That's my vain attempt to draw an eyeball. And that eyeball is positioned directly over the top of the fault, looking straight down. Okay, so imagine then that you, that that eyeball was looking at a, a circle of ground directly over the fault. So that eyeball was, would see just a straight line representing the strike of the fault. That's what this straight line here represents. That represents the strike of the fault. Now, there's going to be a portion of that fault where the ground moved one way and a portion where the ground moved another way. Um, if you imagine the ground moving, um, and imagine uh, if, if this ground, this block here on the left, moved uh, as in a left lateral motion, and let's say that I had a block of soil right here next to this uh, big block. And let's say that block did not want to move at all. But this giant block just thrusts and shoves it right into my block right there. That block of soil is going to get pushed. And it's going to get pushed because it feels compression, OK? Now, if I had a block, another block of soil right here on this other side attached to this block, and this block moves this way, you can see that my little block right here um, is going to, uh, I was going to get pulled with this block, okay? Uh, in other words, there's going to be tension with that little block there. Wherever there is compression, that's going to equal black on my stereo net. Wherever there is tension, that's going to equal white on my beach ball. So check that out. I've got black right there, meaning that in this quadrant, I've got compression because it's that soil is being thrust in a left lateral way. And then, but this quadrant uh, here on the, that I'm I am outlining, uh, it's going to stay white because it's tension uh, from the movement. Now, uh, opposite over here, this quadrant where uh, because of my left lateral motion gets thrust uh, to the right, it's going to cause compression in this portion of my little circle, but tension in the other portion. So compression, here let's erase some of that so that it's not so messy. Compression, and then the white is tension, so this would be indicative then. This beach ball would be indicative of a left lateral strike slip fault. If it was a right lateral strike slip fault, then um, the colors on the beach ball would be, would be um, opposite. Okay, well, let's look at a different one. Uh, there's another type of fault called a normal fault. They're associated with tensile regimes. A normal fault does not experience strike slip. A normal fault experiences dip slip. But it's down dip slip, meaning um, it, it occurs typically in extensional regimes. And in extensional regimes, as the earth is spreading out, uh, the ground has to spread too. So often what happens uh, this is the case of where we live in Utah. So let's say that we have, uh, you know, this is my vain attempt at drawing a mountain range. With a valley in the middle. Okay. So we have mountain, 
we have a mountain over here and then we have a valley right here in the middle okay now if this is an extensional regime that means that something is pulling this whole ground these mountains apart so if if tension and extension pulls these mountains apart that means that this valley here in the middle is going to slide down it's the only way that that extension can ha uh, happen it's the only way that the earth can stretch out so this is uh, this particular uh, geography here uh, or geometry is what we call a grobin it's very common in extensional regimes so um, interestingly enough we call it a normal fault but the reality is a normal fault is not so normal compression and translation are much more common uh, geographic or geologically speaking than extension is so it's really the least common of all the faults um, there are a couple places in the world where there's a lot of extensional faults the inner mountain west in the united states is one of them uh, the the rift valley the rift zones in east africa are another uh, the entire country of italy basically uh, is an extensional faulting regime and there's other places as well now the typical dip angle of these faults dip angle is between 50 to 75 degrees from the horizontal and uh, again we usually see these types of faults associated with grobbins and valleys so a uh, good example of one of these faults would be the wasatch fault which is located right uh, to the east of brigham young university so uh, if we do our stereo net projection here's my eyeball eyelashes looking down on the fault let's draw my circle okay here's what we see this little section right here of the uh, of the fault scarp that is this middle section right here of my stereo net projection uh, you can see that uh, somewhere in here I'm going to be able to see the strike so this would be the strike of the fault okay and again remember this block is sliding down so if I had a block of soil that could measure pressure down here and this block slid into it it would uh, register compression so it's going to be black and if this block if I had a, a little sensor of soil up here and this block on the left slid up into it it would also register pressure or compression so it would show as black so that's why I have black up here and black down here but white in the middle meaning tension so uh, you got to think of it everything is sliding uh, down and up but everything's sliding away so it's just indicative of extension okay so yeah these uh, these stereo net projections they they look like um, eyeballs with white centers that's that's indicative of a normal fault uh, reverse faults these are also dip slip faults but these are different than normal faults because instead of extension now we're dealing with compression so instead of the two blocks sliding away from each other they're sliding toward they're pushing against one another and the fault movement slides up the dip plane not down the dip plane okay so these are very common types of crustal faults they're also very scary because when you're dealing with compression and rock you're dealing with huge forces and massive energy release so reverse faults can be very very large earthquakes um, and the the typical dip angle of these types of faults okay uh, they can vary they can be really shallow uh, like 10 degrees if you have a really shallow reverse fault it has a special name we call it a thrust fault 
So a thrust fault is just a very shallow reverse fault. Uh, but it can also go up to about 55 degrees of dip angle. Uh, and so we would just call that a reverse fault. So again, faults with really low dip angles, usually less than about 40 degrees, we're going to classify them as thrust faults. Remember that reverse faults are typically the most powerful of all of the crustal faults. They produce the largest earthquakes. Um, some examples of some reverse or thrust faults include the Seattle Fault, which runs right through the middle of downtown Seattle, or uh, maybe the, the Himalayan Frontal Thrust Fault uh, over in the Himalayas. Uh, here is our stereo net projection. Um, it looks like a normal fault projection, but it's the exact opposite. The inside of our eyeball is compression, the outside is tension, uh, but the corners of the eyeball still represent the, the angle of the strike on the fault. Okay. So if you ever see uh, a projection like that on a seismic map, then you'll know that that fault is a reverse fault. Now, there's no um, rule that says that earthquakes have to happen in the fault normal or the fault, uh, I'm sorry, that earthquakes have to happen in the strike slip or the dip slip orientations. It's possible that uh, a fault could rupture uh, both or have rupture with a strike component and a dip component. So if an earthquake ruptures down the dip plane, but also along the strike plane, uh, then it is what we call an oblique fault, okay? And most faults, most faults have some level of obliquity to them. Um, there's, it's very rare to have a fault that is purely strike slip or purely dip slip. The uh, stereo net projections, they look like a mixture of either a, like the strike slip projections with the uh, either a reverse or a, um, a normal fault projection. Okay, so all of those, all of those that we talked about were crustal faults. Crustal fault, strike slip, normal, reverse or thrust or an, an oblique, okay? But what about plate boundaries or interfaces between plates? Now, when you have a plate to plate interface, you're not dealing with crustal faults. You're dealing with the entire plate. They're massive. When you have these plate to plate boundaries and you have um, compression going on, we have what we call subduction zones, okay? Subduction zones aren't <coughs> like your grandma's faults. Um, subduction zones are massive interplate boundaries. They're huge and they deal with enormous amounts of pressure, enormous amounts of stress, and can produce enormous earthquakes. Now, uh, uh, with a subduction zone, we generally have two types of subduction zone earthquake events. We have what's called an interplate event and we have what's called an intraplate event. Interplate and intraplate. So interplate events occur in a place where it, it, it basically sounds like it. Inter means between, between two different plates. So um, at the interface between the the oceanic plate that's subducting and the continental plate that is riding on top of the oceanic plate. So at that interface between those two plates is where we get interplate events. A rupture on an interplate event is uh, what we refer to as a mega thrust earthquake. And these are those big magnitude eight magnitude 8.5, magnitude 9, magnitude 9.5 events. They're massive, okay? Now, um, that oceanic crust that's getting shoved and pushed deep down uh, the continental crust, that, that oceanic crust uh, 
is getting bent, getting stressed, getting pulled, and all sorts of strain is occurring with that thing. Now, as that, as that crust is getting recycled back into the mantle, uh, it's not going to go quietly. And oftentimes what happens is um, that bending and stuff can cause cracks and earthquakes in that uh, oceanic crust as it bends and, and gets pulled beneath uh, the, the continental crust and back into the mantle. Those types of earthquakes that occur inside of the, uh, the crust that's being subducted is what we call intraplate. So intra means within or inside of. So inside of the plate. So uh, this is the same type of earthquake that caused the Mexico City event in 2017. It was a Benioff zone um, intraplate subduction zone event. Now the thing that makes these earthquakes particularly, you know, that can make these events dangerous is that they can occur very, very deep, very, very deep, and they can occur directly beneath your feet. So when those waves come up, they haven't had a chance really to attenuate at all. They're coming straight beneath you, so they hit you with a little warning, and they can have some huge ground motions. So interplate events, interplate events result in huge rupture zones, and they can produce tsunamis. Intraplate events usually have smaller magnitudes, but they occur very deep, very deep beneath the ground surface. Okay, sorry, my heater just turned on in the room and it's causing a whole bunch of noise. That's distracting. Let's see if I can turn that off. Maybe. We'll put up with it for a second until it goes off. Okay. Intraplate events, they're deep, they're smaller, but they can be very, very damaging because they are directly beneath your feet, okay? Now, the uh, beach ball for that type of event uh, looks something like this. Now, remember, your, your eyeball is up here. It's looking straight down at this interface right there, and this is what it's going to see, folks. <laughs> this, is your, uh, this is your strike and you have one massive zone over here of compression and one massive zone over here of tension. That is the telltale symbol of, um, of a subduction zone uh, seismic source in, in beach ball notation. So an example of one of these sources would be the Cascadia subduction zone off the northeast coast of the, the United States. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about the size of earthquakes now. When we talk about the size of earthquakes, we generally are talking about earthquake magnitude, okay? And we're going to delve into a little bit of the history of magnitude and, and why magnitude is one of the most misunderstood and mischaracterized terms when it comes to dealing with earthquakes. Now, there are two principal ways that seismologists, geologists, engineers, whomever use to describe the size of an earthquake. The first way is not magnitude, but it's intensity. It's intensity. Um, I was told once by a structural colleague friend of mine, a structural engineering colleague friend of mine, that the magnitude really is, you know, it, it, it can relate to uh, the the uh, ferocity of an earthquake, but the reality is intensity is is a much more telling term in terms of how violent an earthquake can be. It's it's the it's how strong the shake is in the quake. I think that's what he called it. It's the shake in the quake that determines how damaging an earthquake can be, and so the amount of shake in a quake is its intensity. But then we deal with earthquake magnitude, and that's something that everyone's familiar with. It's what we always hear from the reporters whenever we hear about an earthquake on the news. Let's, let's understand these two terms, okay? Earthquake intensity. 
before instruments were ever invented, seismologists, early seismologists wanted to have a way to be able to map and to quantify the amount of quake or the amount of shake in a quake. But they had no way to do it other than to ask people, hey, how hard does your house shake? Was that really bad where you lived? Describe it for me. They had to rely on, on subjective surveys from people. So these surveys, they would be sent out and they would ask people to respond back and describe how strong the shaking was at their different house. And they came up with a set of consistent descriptors and they assigned a number to each of these descriptors. These numbers ranging from usually 1 to 10 uh, or maybe 1 to 12. Okay, 1 being the smallest, 12 being it's the end of the world. Um, now there's lots of different scales and descriptions uh, that have been developed by different seismologists for different intensity models. Uh, some of the more popular ones that have been around, uh, like the Rossi 4L model, that's been used heavily in Italy. The modified Mercalli index, uh, used more commonly now, and it's used, it's probably the one that's used the most frequently around the world including here in the United States. The Medvedev Spoon Hoyer Karnik uh, intensity model is used uh, mostly in Eastern Europe and, and portions of Russia. And then the, the JMA scale for intensity, the Japanese Meteorological Agency scale, this is used uh, predominantly in Japan. Okay, so the one that we're going to talk about and use and refer to in this class is the MMI. So here's some examples uh, of what these descriptions are in an MMI. So imagine being someone whose house was shaken, you're shaken, you, you are trying to still kind of piece together your life and, and, and assess the damage on your home, and then someone comes and, and knocks on your door, or maybe in the mail you get an envelope and it has a little survey in it, and it says, will you please circle the number that best describes the shaking that you felt at your house. And uh, so you can see, you know, some of these descriptions here. Uh, like in number five, it was felt by nearly everyone. Many were awakened. Some dishes, windows, etc. were broken. There was some cracked plaster. Unstable objects overturned. And so, um, I like this one. Pendulum clocks may stop. Uh, they discovered they did some research and found that it takes a very specific acceleration uh, exceeding a specific acceleration to stop a pendulum clock and so uh, it's interesting they included that in there but anyway you can kind of see some of these descriptions you know feel free to pause this video and read some of these to get a feel uh, you can see this one goes all the way up to eight uh, yeah you know some pretty big descriptions there so now once you have, you know, people start returning their surveys, they circle the number and they indicate the address of their house, seismologists then can take the address, take the number that's associated, the, the intensity number associated with that address, and they can start plotting numbers on a map. And once you start plotting numbers on a map, then you can start drawing contours of intensity. Uh, and so then you end up with what are called isoseismal maps. Now the beauty of isoseismal maps is they don't require any instruments. They're all just based off of people uh, self-reporting based on a, a standard set of descriptions. So the, the people become the instruments, so to speak, okay? The advantage of it is that we can take like uh, newspaper descriptions of earthquakes and descriptions in people's journals of old earthquakes and and we can back calculate so to speak what the intensities were or at least come up with our best estimate and so you can come up with maps like this look at this this is an estimated MMI intensity map from the 1811 and 1812 earthquake and it's based off of journal and newspaper entries from the day so you can see, you know, exactly how energy was dissipated 
with distance away from the uh, source of the event, which happened to be right in there. Okay. So that's intensity. Let's talk a little bit about magnitude now. So with the introduction of recording equipment or instruments that could record earthquakes and measure earthquake ground motions, we didn't need to rely on subjective descriptions of earthquakes as much anymore. Instead, we could measure the energies ourselves and be a lot more objective. So seismologists began developing different measure, measure scales to describe the size of earthquakes based off of what they were reading on their instruments. So um, magnitude scales were developed to describe the size of earthquakes. Now there's lots of different magnitude scales. There's not just one magnitude scale, there's different magnitude scales. We're going to talk about these. Uh, beginning with the Richter magnitude, or, or the local magnitude is the more accurate name, the surface wave magnitude, and then the body wave magnitude, and then finally the moment magnitude these four Richter local magnitude so everyone refers to the Richter scale this was a magnitude 6 on the Richter scale you probably heard people say things like that that's one of my biggest pet peeves okay <clears throat> no seismologist uses the Richter scale anymore nobody uses it the only thing we use from the Richter scale is the fact that he used a number scale from uh, 0 to 10 and that's it. The, the magnitudes that we report today have nothing to do with the Richter local magnitude. Um, the Richter local magnitude was developed by Richter in 1935 and it was based on the measurements that you would get from uh, a Wood Anderson seismometer. So a Wood Anderson seismometer, this is a a, a little picture of one down here in the bottom right. It's just a basic pendulum based uh, device where the mass would move and it, that moving mass was attached to a pen and it would then record or, or scribble a line on a piece of paper and, and based on how much that mass moved you know would, would determine the amplitude of the line scribble and, and then you could get uh, how the size of your earthquake. There were lots of problems with this method, and it's the, probably one of the biggest reasons we don't use it. I mean, first of all, uh, Richter developed it only for Southern California earthquakes. That, that Wood Anderson seismometer was calibrated just for earthquakes in Southern California. Um, if earthquakes occurred anywhere else, they were different. It didn't really work. Um, it does not distinguish between wave types. That mass that's on that Wood Anderson seismometer moves regardless of whether you have body waves or surface waves, uh, P waves or S waves, any of those, okay? It doesn't distinguish between the wave types. The other thing that's really interesting is uh, it, it's really sensitive to periods up to 0 0.8 second of vibration. <laughs> and what this really means is uh, that happens to be the uh, period range of the instrument itself. Every object, I don't care what it is, every object has a natural period or natural frequency of vibration. And if you rattle something or shake something at its natural period of vibration, it will rattle itself to pieces. Uh, the Wood Anderson seismometer had a natural period of vibration uh, for periods less than 0.8 seconds. And so earthquake motions less than 0.8 seconds really got it going. And then the other thing was it's saturated at magnitudes uh, greater than 6.5 to 7.0. So what that would look like is if I wanted to plot, say, If I wanted to plot, let's see, um, earthquake size, I'll actually call it actual earthquake size or energy. And this right here is local magnitude. 
on the y-axis. What we would see is that as earthquake size grew, local magnitude would grow as well, and it would grow, grow together until we, at some certain size, it would level out and it would saturate. And that size happened to be right around about 6.5 to 7 or so. So even if the energy was much greater than a 6.5, it would still register as a 6.5 or a 7. And some students have asked me why that occurred. I don't really have an answer why it saturates. One seismologist told me once it's because the, uh, the mass of the seismometer uh, was hitting the side of the box and couldn't move any further. I don't know if that's true, but it still makes me laugh thinking about it. So. Um, anyway, folks, that's the Richter local magnitude. Uh, I hope you never make the mistake again of saying, uh, to referring to the magnitude of an event as the Richter magnitude, because it's just not accurate. Another magnitude scale is called the surface wave magnitude. It's labeled as M sub S, S being for surface wave. This is solely based on the amplitude of Rayleigh waves with a specific period of 20 seconds, okay? So the, the period of the wave is 20 seconds. Now, uh, this magnitude scale is based on displacement of the ground, not the acceleration of the ground, which is kind of interesting. Here's the equation to compute the, uh, the surface wave magnitude, where A is the maximum ground displacement from the Rayleigh wave of a period of 20 seconds. And it's in units of micrometers. So we're talking really small displacements, okay? And then <clears throat> this capital delta right here, it's referred to in the literature as the epicentral distance, but it's not really a distance, it's an angle. What angle is it? Well, if, if you draw just a two-dimensional representation of the Earth, like is shown right here, Imagine the earthquake happening somewhere and draw a line straight to the core of the earth and then from the core of the earth straight up to your recording station. That angle that is formed, that angle is delta. That's the epicentral distance. That's not really a distance. It's an angle. Okay. Well, uh, there were problems with the surface wave magnitude as well. Uh, because it's based on surface waves, it's not really built to handle deep earthquakes that are governed by body waves, not surface waves, or it's not built to handle earthquakes that are close. And by close, I mean generally, um, I'm going to say less than about 50 kilometers. Any earthquakes that are close to them, about 50 kilometers, yeah, surface wave magnitude is terrible. And why is that? Well, because body waves are what's reaching your instrument, not surface waves. And then, uh, like we saw with local magnitude, we, we would get saturation in our uh, magnitudes at about 8 to 8.5. So we can read energies up to 8 to 8.5 on a scale, but anything greater than 8 or 8.5, it will max out. And we will never calculate a number greater than 8 to 8.5. Okay, well, if you have a surface wave magnitude, then you need to have a body wave magnitude, and we do. And that's uh, labeled with an M with a little sub B there. Um, and this is based on the first few cycles of the arriving P waves to the instrument. So it's not based on S waves, it's based on P waves, uh, and so those compression body waves. This is much better suited for the deeper earthquakes or earthquakes that are really close to you. Um, here's the equation for it, where A now is the amplitude in your instrument from the P wave arrival, and it's in micrometers. Then we have T, which is the period of the P wave. So it's going to usually be around one second, but of course, you know, you're not going to guess that. You're going to measure it from your recordings. Uh, 
And then uh, as before, capital D, this is the epicentral distance, which really isn't a distance, it's an angle. There's some problems with the body wave magnitude. First of all, it's not really suited for large, shallow earthquakes. Those are the types of earthquakes um, that are better for, uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, surface wave magnitude. And then uh, it saturates. It saturates at a magnitude of 6.5, which is kind of stinky. So um, not really fun, you know? It's, it's a problem with all these different magnitude scales that they saturate. It's good for small earthquakes, but for large earthquakes, you, you can't accurately characterize the amount of energy that's there. And so uh, this is why seismologists said we need a better way and they developed a better way. It's called moment magnitude. Moment meaning it's based on the seismic moment. Remember what we talked about? Computing the amount of energy released by a rupturing earthquake or the amount of work performed by the earthquake. So uh, moment magnitude looks like this. It's an M with a, a W subscript. I'm not sure why it's W, but we use it. The interesting thing is it's not based on any single instrument. It's based on the computation of the seismic moment. It is the most commonly used magnitude scale among scientists and seismologists today. And here's the equation for it. It's simply the, the logarithm of the seismic moment divided by 1.5 minus 10.7. That's it. It's simple. And you have to remember that the seismic moment is going to be in units of ergs. Uh, ergs are also the same as dyne centimeters, okay? There's a lot of advantages um, to this that, that we'll talk about, but the most, the most significant one is it does not saturate. Moment magnitude has no saturation. It will go all the way up to 10 if you need it to. This is the magnitude that we use today. If you ever hear a magnitude that's reported on the news after an earthquake or that you hear the U.S. Geological Survey talking about a magnitude, it's the moment magnitude. It's, but it's always mistaken by the media for the Richter magnitude. Okay. So we can estimate the amount of energy released from an earthquake using surface wave magnitude or moment magnitude. Um, but let's go ahead and use moment magnitude. Let's compare the amount of energy released from a magnitude six event with the energy released from magnitude eight event, okay? So uh, here's the equation we're going to use. By the way, you're going to look at this and say, where did I get this equation? I'm gonna go back to this slide. It's just this equation for moment magnitude, but all I'm doing is reorganizing the equation to solve for the seismic moment, okay? That's all I'm doing, see? Okay, so let's go ahead and do a calculation. So energy is essentially um, just the seismic moment. So we're going to solve for M not. And if I plug in um, 6 for my moment magnitude, like I did right here, and I run that calculation, I'm going to get 1.12 times 10 to the 25th ergs of energy. That's a lot. Now if I do the same calculation for magnitude 8, I get 1.12 times 10 to the 28th ergs. So the difference between these calculated energies is the difference in energy release from a magnitude 6 to a magnitude 8. So if I just divide the two, I get a thousand times. A thousand. There is a thousand times more energy in the magnitude 8 event than there is in the magnitude 6 event. Which makes sense, right? To go from a magnitude 6 to a magnitude 7 is 10 times. They go from a magnitude seven to a magnitude um, eight is, uh, then we're going to multiply that by a hundred times. So 10 times a hundred, I get a thousand. Because it's a logarithmic scale. That's how that works, okay? So let's compare intensity versus magnitude. 
when for dealing with units of intensity, we have to remember that it's subjective. It's not based off any measured number. It's it's based off uh, our perception of the shaking and a set of of descriptions that are provided. It can vary based on location, just depending on where the shaking is the most intense. It requires a survey of people, generally, though uh, we there have been studies in recent uh, decades that have correlated intensity back to measured ground motions for instruments. In that instance, then it's not really subjective, but um, it was intended to be a subjective measure. From it, we can produce isoseismal maps, and it is strongly influenced by local site conditions. On the other hand, magnitude, it's an objective measure of earthquake size. It is a constant value independent of your location. It doesn't matter if you're standing right over the focus of the earthquake or if you're on the other side of the world. The magnitude of the earthquake is the same. Why is that? Because magnitude is just a, a constant measure of the energy released by the earthquake. It, it has nothing to do with your location relative to the earthquake. It's the, it's the amount of energy released by the earthquake. Intensity depends on your location relative to the earthquake. Okay. Uh, magnitude is calculated from instruments. Uh, we don't have a map because it's just a single value, so it doesn't change depending on where you're, where you are, and it's really independent of any local site conditions. So, uh, one question that I always like to ask: Let's imagine that uh, you and your friend are visiting the Bay Area in in California. One of you is standing on top of a tall building. The other of you is out visiting Alcatraz Island and you're standing on a rock out in the middle of the bay. And an earthquake happens. Okay, are each of you going to feel the same intensity from the earthquake? Think about it. If you answered no, then you answered correctly. Uh, each of you is going to feel a different amount of shaking from the earthquake because each of you is standing on a different medium. One of you is on rock, the other is on a tall, flexible building. The shaking you feel is going to be different between the two of you. Next question. Will each of you experience the same magnitude of earthquake? Think about it. If you answered yes, then you answered correctly. Because magnitude is not dependent upon your local site conditions. It's not dependent on where you are relative to the earthquake. Magnitude is constant for a given earthquake event because it is an objective measure of the total amount of energy released by the earthquake. So let's wrap up. We've been talking for a long time and I hope that you were able to take some breaks or break this up into a couple of different uh, uh, lessons. But the last thing we want to talk about, Wells and Coppersmith empirical relationships. Now, uh, some seismologists have come along and said, are there empirical methods that we can use to predict magnitudes? If we know a fault, for instance, if we know a fault is... Let me just draw my trapezoidal mountain range again and my three-dimensional fault here. Okay. If we know this fault right there and we know its length, say we know its width or its depth. We know uh, all of these different things about the fault. Could we predict how large a magnitude would be of an event that would happen if that fault were to rupture? So seismologists, Wells, 
and Coppersmith. I've, I've, I've never met Wells. I've met Kevin Coppersmith. He's an amazing guy. One of the most, uh, most brilliant, smartest guys I've ever met. And, and he's very, very kind as well. Um, Wells and Coppersmith said, I think you could. And so they collected fault geometry data for a whole bunch of faults that experienced earthquakes. And then they plotted um, the fault geometries or different fault geometry parameters like surface rupture length or fault width or fault depth with the magnitude of the earthquake that occurred. And they wanted to see if there was a correlation. Well, what they found was, yeah, there was definitely a correlation. So they fit some lines to it and they came up with some equations. Those equations look like this, okay? Why right here, it's just a generic term for something you're solving for. It could be surface rupture length, it could be rupture width, it could be rupture area, it could be surface displacement. You could plug any of those things in for Y, but then uh, X is your independent variable. It's the variable that you know or can measure, and uh, it can also be any one of these, surface rupture length, rupture width, rupture area, surface displacement. So um, given what you know, you can solve for something that you don't know, but you want to know, and uh, their relationship will give you the value of A and the value of B that you need to plug in, and it will also give you the standard deviation to, to characterize the spread in, the, in their, their data. So that's the dependent variable, regression coefficients, x is the independent variable. That t right there, this is going to be the student's t distribution. Now, um, if you're reading or listening to this and you have no idea what I'm talking about or probability is not your cup of tea, then I strongly recommend when this lesson is finished that you go on and listen to, uh, I give a little teeny crash course uh, in this series on probability and using probability to estimate uncertainty. So um, that would be a good thing for you to, to have a look at. This alpha is the probability of non-exceedance. That S is the standard deviation and that N is the number of events in the data set. So it's the number of points minus one in the data set, okay? It's also known as the, um, the I believe, the degrees of freedom. Okay. So, um, with that equation, uh, for my class, I've given you a handout. It's in under content. My colleague and good friend, Dr. Travis Gerber, prepared a, a nice little example problem, a nice little worksheet that you guys can go through, and, and he can help you with that. Um, it, it's going to look something like this. Let's see, where did it go? There it is. Okay, so it's going to look something like this, where it will talk to you uh, about the different parameters, the different terms, shows you the equations, introduces you to those. Here's a table taken straight out of Wells and Coppersmith's paper. So you can see all of the different equations right here, okay? And uh, you can, oh no, it won't just delete the whole line. That's awful. Okay, sorry, didn't know it would do that. So now I have to erase. It only erases where I touch, that's not convenient. Okay, so you can see all those equations. M means magnitude, or moment magnitude. SRL means surface rupture length. RLD is uh, subsurface rupture length. RW is down dip rupture width. Uh, 
of the fault. RA is rupture area of the fault. So you can see um, we're we are picking one thing that we know and we're solving for something else that we don't. And we have different fault types that we can use. So SS is strike slip, R is reverse, N is normal, and all means is just the combination of all crustal faults thrown in together. You can see we have our A values. They're to the they're the values that are outside the parentheses, okay? The B values those are also outside the parentheses. And then our standard deviations, those are in there. This number of events, that is uh, similar to the degrees of freedom. So those are the values that you're going to use for these assignments. So for instance, here's an example problem. Let's say we wanted to estimate the mean surface rupture length. Okay, mean means no standard deviation. We're, we're going to ignore the standard deviation. We're just going to take the best fit value. Okay, so if I want to estimate the mean surface uh, rupture length for an earthquake of a magnitude 6.9. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to look for an equation that will give me surface rupture length given magnitude. Can you find it? If this is where you pointed, then you are correct. This is magnitude is given, and if we give magnitude, we can compute surface rupture length. So that's the equation we're going to use. So we pull an A value out. Oh, it says we're going to use the all slip type. So if I go over to all, you can see my A is negative 3.22, my B is 0.69, and this is my equation. So I'm going to plug in those values into that equation for a magnitude 6.9 and I'm going to solve and for surface rupture length I get 34.8 kilometers. Okay. Now uh, part B says estimate the expected surface rupture length for the same earthquake but this time with a 90% probability of not being exceeded. So if that's the case, then I need the T value of 90%. So T of 90. The degree of freedom is going to be the number of events minus 1. So that's going to give me 76. So anyway, I'm going to plug all those numbers in. So you'll see that this right here is the same equation as above. But now I just have the additional uncertainty component. So uh, that 1.293, that's my T value. That 0 0.22, that's my standard deviation from the table. The 77, that's from the event, or the number of events from the table. And I plug all of those in and I compute 67.1 kilometers. So in other words, I can have 90% confidence that my surface rupture length will not exceed 67.1 kilometers for a magnitude 6.9 event. See how that works? It's pretty cool. Now, if you're wondering what in the world is that T value of 1.293, where did you get that? You can get it from a, uh, a probability table like this, you can look for those online, find them in a statistics book, or you can do some study in Excel to find out how to use the, the formula for the T distribution, uh, which I think is T dist in uh, Excel, and that will help you get it as well. Uh, and go watch the video, it'll talk a little bit about how to use those T distributions, okay? We'll talk more about that on Friday, though. We'll go through some examples and, and help solve uh, the questions that you have. So, uh, problems, though, with this Wells and Coppersmith model. You know, there's no such thing as a perfect model, and, and Wells and Coppersmith had some problems. Um, most of their fault data came from active faulting regimes, so from the Western United States and stuff like that. They didn't have a lot of data from stable continental regions like the central or eastern United States. 
and they didn't really have any subduction zone regions or subduction zone data in there either. It was all just crustal faults. And then, of course, you know, leave it to we engineers to uh, mess things up, and we start using the equations improperly or making inappropriate uh, interpretations of the equations, and and it just becomes messy. Okay. And then uh, the final, you know, another thing that that is uh, a problematic with wells and coppersmith for 1994 it's great but we've got like 10 times the data now since 1994 and so um, using those models we're, we're using outdated empirical data so recognizing some of these problems uh, another group of seismologists more recently published a paper in 2013 sterling and others and uh, it's an updated set of magnitude estimation relationships. The cool thing about these is they, uh, they're divided up like this. You select your plate tectonic setting, okay? So uh, you could have either A, B, C, or D. You could be at a plate boundary, crustal. You could be stable continental. You could be subduction zone, or you can be volcanic. If you're a plate boundary crustal, then uh, you could be moving fast, so you're an A1. You could be slow moving, or so infrequent earthquakes, that's A2. And then you can pick uh, your different uh, fault types. You could be strike slip, all faults, normal or reverse. You can also see they've got these relationships for central and eastern United States. Central, you know, these are stable continental regions. They also started to put together some uh, relationships for subduction zones. So, um, you part of your assigned reading is to read the Sterling and others paper, uh, and you're going to do some work with some of those models on your homework. So, I strongly recommend you read it write down any questions that you have and come uh, get those questions answered from me or any of the TAs. So, long lesson, I know. I hope you broke it up into different parts, but honestly and truly, really good, really important stuff that we use every day to predict uh, the size and the occurrence of earthquakes. So, uh, thanks for watching and be sure to leave any comments if you have any questions or come find me after class. I'll be happy to help you. Thanks.